you know, when people ask me when I'm in an audience if I'd like to move forward, it, it um, inflames the remnants of original sin. <laughs> and, and my instantaneous heartfelt response is, no, I don't. However, um, because you folks are amongst the elite of the elect, um, <laughs> I would like to suggest that you move forward. Now, there is a reason. Ordinarily, I really don't care where you sit. You can sit at the back if you want. But I had hoped that there would be some place for Q&A a a little later. And um, we hope to have some roving mics that will pass back and forth and so on. And it'll be a lot easier to do that sort of thing if folks are sitting together in a clump than if they're scattered over um, a hall that is designed for 2,000 people. So if you don't mind moving forward a little bit, it will help later. And if, in fact, the remnants of original sin prevail, not much I can do about it. Well, let's begin with prayer. At a time in history, Heavenly Father, when tolerance has become such a buzzword, far more important than truth or righteousness or integrity, Help us to understand something of the history of tolerance. Help us to understand something of the limits of tolerance. Help us to understand something of the changing face of tolerance, lest we begin to worship a false god. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, I, well, not, not, not a few, in fact, it was just about a year ago, I published a book called The Intolerance of Tolerance. I'm sure there are copies in the bookstore, although I haven't checked. Um, and it was an attempt to uh, understand one of the most uh, dramatic social pressures in Western culture to this day and how Christians should think about responding to it. So much of what I'm going to say is uh, drawn from that book. That book gives far, far more um, uh, illustrations, not only in this country but in the UK and to some extent in France and elsewhere. Um, uh, I will spare you some of those. You can read them for yourselves. And then I try to work out how Christians should begin to respond to it so that in the last chapter I, I try to uh, show some of the steps we have to take. I'll say a little bit about that latter at the end. But because I'm sure that most in this room have not read the book at all, let me begin with some definitions and, uh, and introductions to the matter. To speak of the intolerance of tolerance might strike some people as nothing more than arrant nonsense, an unbearable oxymoron, as meaningless as talking about the hotness of cold or the blackness of white or the like. Tolerance is today as non-negotiable a virtue in the culture at large as motherhood and apple pie were in America in the 1950s. There are certain things you don't, just don't question, and tolerance is one of them. To put the matter another way, tolerance has become part of what sociologists nowadays call the Western plausibility structure. As far as I know, that expression, plausibility structure, was first coined by sociologist Peter Berger. He uses it to refer to structures of thought widely and almost unquestioningly accepted throughout a particular culture. One of his derivative arguments is that in a tight monolithic culture like, let's say, Japan, the reigning plausibility structures may be enormously interwoven, interlocked, and complex. And it's really difficult for an outsider to get into that sort of culture and understand all those given assumptions that just about everybody in the culture works with. 
By contrast, in a highly diverse culture like that which dominates many in the Western world, not least the United States, the plausibility structures are, structures are necessarily much, much, much more restricted for the very good reason that there are fewer stances held in common. The plausibility structures that do remain, however, in such a society tend to be held with extra tenacity because they are the few things that hold us all together. And tolerance, I'm suggesting, is in much of the Western world part of this restricted but tenaciously held plausibility structure. To saunter into the public square and to question it, to suggest that this tolerance may in fact be intolerant, is not only to tilt at windmills, but is culturally insensitive, it appears, and lacking in good taste, even boorish. But if I press on, it's because I remain persuaded that the emperor has no clothes, or at least he's not sporting much more than his jockey shorts. And it really is important, I think, to understand what has gone on. Let's begin with the fact that the very notion of tolerance has changed. In the past, tolerance was a parasitic virtue. That is to say, it was a virtue that depended on a whole lot of other cultural virtues. So that any culture, whether in ancient pagan Rome, before Christ, or in the medieval period with the dominance of the Catholic Church, it doesn't matter what culture, every culture has some structures that are more or less widely accepted as rights and wrongs and what's permitted, what's approved, what's cherished, what's valued, what's despised, and so on. And they're more or less universally held, but those who don't hold them raise a certain kind of problem for the culture. What do we do with such people? Do we tolerate them? Or do we burn them at the stake? Do we crush them? Do we allow them to speak? How much divergence do we allow from what seems to be pretty normative in the culture at large? And that's a question that is raised in communism, it's raised in Nazism, it's, it's, it's raised in a democracy, so, so that every culture has, a, has, has limits to how far you can go. For example, take a very easy one today. Whatever the sexual freedoms that are enjoyed and promulgated and promoted today, virtually no one in our culture is pushing pedophilia. In fact, there are criminal sanctions against that. We do not tolerate pedophilia. So every society has some places where they draw the line, where there are intolerances it's imposed, you see? And every society has some things that are tolerated. A society that tolerates very, very little divergence is a pretty repressed society, either that or a pretty, a pretty uh, unified society. A society that is very, very free then is considered to be a little more tolerant, but, but tolerance is, is, is never seen in the ancient world uh, or until a hundred years ago as a virtue in and of itself. It's a parasitic virtue. That is, it depends on what the, the, the assumed virtues are in the culture at large. You, you can't raise tolerance up to the level of supreme virtue because, be, because you have to be tolerant of something or intolerant of something. And that already presupposes that there is an array of virtues and of reprehensible things that are actually out there. Do you see? It is necessarily a parasitic virtue. It is parasitic on the assumptions of goodness and badness in the broader culture at large. Now, with that kind of understanding of tolerance, then, there are endless debates in history, in church history, in the pagan world, as to what divergencies you allow. Do you burn witches at the stake? Or do you slap them in jail? Or do you say, it doesn't really matter, they can do what they want? How about selling porn? Do you allow it? Or do you criminalize it? And on and on and on. All of those examples presuppose, you see, that, that there are some virtues that are accepted by the courts or by the state or by the culture at large, and, and then there are degrees of tolerance that are allowed or intolerance if you go too far and so forth. 
That also means that if you're in the domain of religion, if you are tolerant toward other religions, then what you are really saying is, I may dislike what you are saying, but I defend to the death your right to say it. That's a slogan that is often ascribed to the French philosopher Voltaire, although there's no evidence that he actually said it. But it's just too good to quote, so I'll quote it again, even though he didn't say it. I don't have a clue who first said it. I may detest what you are saying, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Such a person is considered tolerant. That's the old tolerance. And the, the virtue of that tolerance is you can disagree with a person and still be judged tolerant if you are allowing the other person to speak and indeed insisting that he has the right to speak. But the new tolerance comes along and says that in many, many domains, it is wrong to say that the other person is wrong. That's the one thing that is wrong. If you say that somebody else is wrong in these agreed domains, then you are intrinsically an intolerant person. So if you say, for example, that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, you make exclusive claims for Christ on the basis of what the Bible itself says, then there are many people today who will charge you with being intolerant. Now, a hundred years ago, that charge wouldn't have made any sense at all in our culture because we're not putting in jail anybody who happens to be a Buddhist. We're, 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 not, we're not putting in jail anybody who's a Muslim just because he's a Muslim. We're not putting in jail anybody who's a Christian just because he's a Christian. It, it doesn't make any sense. Moreover, Muslims have a right to criticize Christians, and Christians have a right to criticize Buddhists, and we have a right to interact with one another and say where we think the other one's right or wrong and give the reasons why and so on. And that's still considered in the older tolerance an eminently tolerant society because you can push away at the values that are espoused by, by one religious claim or another. You can argue things out in the open marketplace of ideas. But in the new tolerance, the new tolerance might say, that religion is most tolerant and therefore most virtuous that refuses to say that other religions are wrong. And that view has become so dominant, so powerful in our culture for all kinds of reasons that instead of being parasitic on a whole value system, it has become the ultimate good. The effect of that is that it, um, it makes it difficult to have serious moral conversation because you've already been squashed into silence by being labeled intolerant and therefore not worth listening to. Tim Keller likes to talk about defeater beliefs. A defeater belief is a belief which, if you hold it to be true, whether or not it is true makes no difference, if you hold it to be true, it defeats other beliefs. That's a defeater belief. So supposing you hold, for whatever reason, good, bad, or indifferent, supposing you hold passionately that there is no one way to God, then somebody comes along and announces that Jesus insists, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That the apostles insisted there is no other name under heaven given to human beings by which we must be saved. Then that defeater belief might hear you and say, oh, is that what Christians believe? Boy, it's not worth listening to. In other words, the subject itself won't be engaged because it has already been defeated by the defeater belief that dismisses any claim that is made of an exclusive sort. Do you see? And so you, you suddenly realize that this new form of tolerance actually becomes intolerant of those who disagree with that form of tolerance. So starting off with a claim for extra virtue 
it ends up actually being remarkably inconsistent. Now, let me fill this out just a wee bit more um, before I try to lay out some ways ahead. Let me clarify things a bit, first of all, on the two tolerances. Supposing someone says, she is a very tolerant person. Does this mean she gladly puts up with a lot of opinions with which she disagrees? or that she thinks all opinions are equally valid. You see, both uses of tolerance still operate in our culture, both the older one and the newer one. So if somebody says she's a very tolerant person, which is meant? A Muslim cleric says, we do not tolerate other religions. Does this mean, according to this cleric, that Muslims do not think that other religions should be permitted to exist or that Muslims cannot agree that other religions are equally as valid as Islam, equally valid as Islam? Or a Christian pastor declares, Christians gladly tolerate other religions. Does this mean, according to the pastor, that Christians gladly insist that other religions have as much right to exist as Christianity does? Tolerance number one. Or that Christians gladly assert that all religions are equally valid, tolerance number two. You Christians are so intolerant, someone asserts. Does this mean that Christians wish all positions contrary to their own to be extirpated? Or that Christians insist that Jesus is the only way to God? The former is patently untrue. The latter is certainly true. And you begin to see that even in the area of conversation, if there's an ambiguity about the meaning of tolerance, suddenly uh, accusations can be thrown that are far more biting than might be perceived. Go back to the section, to the, to the assertion, uh, Christians gladly tolerate other religions. Now we'll discover that there are a couple of other distinctions that need to be thrown in as well. Let's assume for the moment that the first meaning of toleration is in view. That is, Christians gladly insist that other religions have as much right in our fallen and broken world to exist as their own, however much those who name the name of Christ and who really understand the Bible really are convinced that other religions are in some respects deeply mistaken and do not provide salvation. Even in this more classical understanding of tolerance, we find room for a certain amount of vagueness. Does the statement envisage legal tolerance? In that case, it is affirming that Christians gladly fight for the equal standing before the law of all religious minorities. Of course, from a Christian perspective, this is a temporary arrangement that lasts only until Christ returns. It is a way of saying that in this fallen and broken world, in this time of massive idolatry, in this age of theological and religious co confusion, God has so ordered things that conflict, idolatry, confrontation, and wildly disparate systems of thought, even about God himself, persist and should not be obliterated by the sword. But Christians who know their Bible will still say, in the new heaven and the new earth, God's desires will not be contested, but will be the object of worshiping delight. For the time being, however, Caesar has the responsibility to preserve social order in a chaotic world. Although Caesar functions under God's providential sovereignty, nevertheless there is a difference between God and Caesar. Jesus himself has told us to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. But it will not be like that in the new heaven and the new earth. Thus, even our current legal tolerance, which Christians should surely defend, belongs to the present world order, to the time when the kingdom of God has dawned but has not yet been consummated. Because one day, God will not tolerate anything that steps outside the purpose of his holy will in the new heaven and the new earth. Is intolerance then a sin? Or is it merely the entailment of a holy God being God in that context, in a perfect world? But if Christians try to take that context of a perfect world, which is not yet, and bring it back to here, then Christians themselves will become persecutors. Of course, 
In the right context, the same sentence Christians gladly tolerate other religions might suggest not legal tolerance but social tolerance. That is, in a multicultural society, people of different religions should mix together without slights and condescension for all people have been made in the image of God. That's right. All will give an account to Him on the last day. That's right. Of all people, Christians ought to know that they are not one whit socially superior to others. They talk about a great Savior, but they do not think of themselves as a great people. So social tolerance should be encouraged. And so on. We could make further distinctions. Now, in the older view of tolerance, a person might be judged tolerant, I've said, if while holding strong views, he or she insisted that others had the right to dissent from those views and argue their own cases. Now, this older view of tolerance makes several assumptions. Number one, there is objective truth out there, and it is our duty to pursue truth. Number two, the various parties in a dispute think that they know what the truth of the matter is, even though they disagree sharply, each party thinking that the other party is wrong. And number three, nevertheless, they hold that the best chance of uncovering the truth of the matter, or the best chance of persuading most people with reason and not with coercion, is by the unhindered exchange of ideas, no matter how wrong-headed some of those ideas may seem to us. In other words, this third assumption demands that all sides insist that their opponents must not be silenced or, or crushed. Free inquiry may eventually bring the truth out. It is unlikely to convince the greatest. It is likely, some people argue, sometimes a bit naively, it, it is likely to convince the greatest number of people. Now, one version of this older view of tolerance, we might call it the secular libertarian version has another wrinkle to it. In his famous text on liberty, John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, opts for a secularist basis to tolerance. In the domain of religion, Mill argues, there are insufficient rational grounds for verifying the truth claims of any religion. The only reasonable stance toward religion is therefore public agnosticism in the domain of religion and private benign tolerance. For Mill, in other words, people should be tolerant in the domain of religion not because this is the best way to uncover the truth, but precisely because whatever the truth, there are insufficient means for uncovering it. And that view of tolerance also circulates very widely today. Now, there was a parable made famous by a slightly different thinker, Gotthold Lessing, 1729 to 1781, which nicely illustrates this perspective. It, is, it circulates in all the literature on this subject. Lessing sets his parable in the 12th century during the Third Crusade. The setting is critical to understanding what Lessing was trying to establish by his parable. This setting is a conversation among three characters, each of whom represents one of the world's three monotheistic religions. Saladin, the Muslim sultan, Nathan the wise, a Jew, and a Christian knight Templar. So Saladin says to Nathan the wise, you are so wise. Now tell me, I entreat, what human faith, what theological law has struck you as the truest and the best? Now, instead of answering directly, Nathan tells his parable, which, of course, it's Lessing that's creating. A man owned an opal ring of superlative beauty and extraordinary, not to say magical, powers. Whoever wore it was beloved by God and by human beings. He had received it from his father, who had received it from his father, and so on and so on. It had been passed down from generation to generation through time immemorial. The man with the ring, then, had three sons, each of whom he loved equally, and to each of whom he promised at one time or another to give the ring. Approaching death, a man realized, of course, that he couldn't make good on his promises. 
So he secretly asked a master jeweler to make two perfect copies of the ring. The jeweler did such a magnificent job that the rings were physically indistinguishable even though only one had the magical powers. Now on his deathbed, the man called each of his sons to his side individually, with the others not knowing that each had been invited in. And he gave to each a ring. And the man did the decent thing and died. Only then did his sons discover that each of the sons had a ring. They began to argue about which one now possessed the magical ring. In the play, Nathan the Wise describes their bickering and comments. Quote, they, that is the brothers, investigate, recriminate, and wrangle all in vain, which was the true original genuine ring. This was undemonstrable, almost as much as now by us is undemonstrable the one true faith. So wanting to resolve their dispute, the brothers ask a wise judge to settle the issue, but his ruling refuses to discriminate. The judge says, if each of you in truth received his ring straight from his father's hand, let each believe his own to be the true and genuine ring. The judge urges the brothers to abandon their quest to determine which ring is the magical original. Each brother should instead accept his ring as if it were the original and in that conviction live a life of moral goodness. This would bring honor both to their father and to God. Now, Lessing's parable resonates with his 18th century Enlightenment readers. The three great monotheistic religions were so similar that each group should happily go on thinking that their religion was the true one and focus on lives of virtue and goodness free of nasty dogmatism, the dogmatism that was blamed for the bloody wars of the previous century. What was called for, in other words, was religious tolerance. There is no harm in believing that your monotheistic religion is best, provided you live a good life and let others think of their religion as their best. So there's small wonder that this parable retains its appeal to readers in the 21st century. People today are no less skeptical about claims to exclusive religious truth than were Lessing's readers. They will be inclined to think well of a religion if it produces morally respectable, nice, religiously tolerant adherents. But today, of course, the parable would have to be revised. Instead of three rings, we would need dozens of them, if not hundreds, to symbolize the mutual acceptability of the many religious options, monotheistic, polytheistic, non-theistic. And of course, we could not concede today, as Lessing could, that one of the rings was actually original and with magic powers. None of them is. That's the secular option. But in some ways, Lessing's parable is, when you stop to think about it, not very satisfying. To make the parable work, at least three rather ridiculous stances have been incorporated into the story. Number one, <clears throat> the God figure in the parable, the man with the original magic ring, foolishly promises the ring to each of his three sons even though he knows full well he cannot make good on his multiple promises. Far from loving his three sons equally, he is presented as a weak fool who makes impossible promises. This is not an incidental detail to the story. It is an essential component that sets up why the father goes to the trouble of deceiving at least two of his sons with fake rings. So, has God made impossible and mutually conflicting promises to his disparate sons, ostensibly loving all of them so much he ends up lying to them? Number two, the entire parable presupposes that we, the readers of the parable, know what God has done. Far from fostering a benign tolerance on the ground that we cannot know which ring is the original, this tolerance is in reality grounded in the dogmatic certainty that God himself has produced fake rings because he cannot bear to disappoint any of his sons. In other words, the story works 
only because the reader has the outsider's knowledge of what God has done. Far from advocating a certain kind of epistemological restraint grounded in our ignorance of what God has done, the parable assumes the reader knows exactly what God is like. He is the kind of father who happily creates counterfeit rings to keep his boys happy and in the dark. Three, equally implausible in the story is the way in which the fake rings are physically indistinguishable from the genuine original, yet lacking in the original's power. If over time the original does not produce distinctive blessings owing to its magical properties, its magic is so weak as to be irrelevant. In other words, the counterfeits are not only good copies physically, but they seem to work as well as the original, provided each son thinks the copy is the original. In other words, we're taken away from a powerful religion that actually transforms people to multiple religions where it doesn't matter all that much whether one of them is truly powerful or not. What matters is that its defenders think that it is powerful. The same problem faces the account of the dialogue between Timothy and the Muslim caliph of Baghdad about A.D. 800, an account that Philip Jenkins has made popular. <clears throat> I quote, Consider the story told by Timothy, a patriarch of the Nestorian church. Around 800, he engaged in a famous debate with a Muslim caliph in Baghdad, a discussion marked by reason and civility on both sides. Imagine, Timothy said, that we are all in a dark house and someone throws a precious pearl in the midst of a pile of ordinary stones. Everyone scrabbles for the pearl and some think they found it, but nobody can be sure until day breaks. In the same way, he said, the pearl of true faith and wisdom had fallen into the darkness of this transitory world. Each faith believed that it alone had found the pearl. Yet all he could claim and all the caliph could say in response was that some faiths thought they had enough evidence to prove that they were indeed holding the real pearl, but the final truth would not be known in this world. So once again, there is a precious pearl, but only one precious pearl. Under this narrative, the dawning light will expose the stones for what they are. Still, even though Lessing's parable is riddled with conceptual problems, one understands how it makes a powerful appeal in his own day and continues to resonate with many readers in our world too. In one respect, however, Lessing's parable is not very contemporary at all. Both Mill and Lessing thought that there is objective truth out there. After all, there is an original magic ring. But their rationalist and secular presuppositions drove them to infer that at least in some domains the truth is not acceptable. One can think that something or other is true and argue the case, but if one cannot prove that this something is true in a manner that conforms to the verification standards of public science, then the wisest stance is benign tolerance. In other words, here's my point. You knew I'd get here eventually. The older view of tolerance held either that the truth is objective and can be known and that the best way to uncover it is bold tolerance of those who disagree since sooner or later the truth will win out or that while truth can be known in some domains, it probably can't be known in other domains and that the wisest and least malignant course in such cases is benign tolerance grounded in the superior knowledge that recognizes our limitations. By contrast, the new tolerance today argues that there is no one view that is exclusively true. Strong opinions are nothing more than strong preferences for a particular version of reality, each version equally true. Lessing wanted people to be tolerant because, according to him, we cannot be sure which ring is the magic one, but he did not deny that there is a magic ring. The new approach to tolerance argues that all the rings are equally magic or unmagic, that means the reason for being tolerant is not that we cannot know which ring is magic, nor that this is the best way to find out which ring is magic, but rather that since all the rings are equally magic or non-magic, it is irresponsible to suggest that any of the rings is merely a clever imitation without magical power. We must be tolerant not because we cannot distinguish the right path from the wrong path, but because all paths are equally right. 
And then if you begin with this new view of tolerance and then elevate it to the supreme position in the hierarchy of moral virtues, then the supreme sin is intolerance. The trouble is that such intolerance, like the new tolerance, is also taken on a new definition. Intolerance is no longer a refusal to allow contrary opinions to say their piece in public, but must be understood to be any questioning or contradicting the view that all opinions are equal in value, that all worldviews have equal worth, that all stances are equally valid. To question such axioms is, by definition, intolerant. For such questioning there is no tolerance whatsoever, for it is classed as intolerance, which is the supreme sin, and must therefore be condemned. It has become the supreme vice and becomes a defeater belief which will not allow public conversation of moral and religious questions. Now the importance of the distinction between the older view of tolerance and the newer view can scarcely be exaggerated. I don't think it is possible to make sense of an awful lot of public proclamations on tolerance without understanding the distinction. In a much quoted line, Leslie Armour, professor emeritus of philosophy at the University of Ottawa writes, our idea is that to be a virtuous citizen is to be one who tolerates everything except intolerance. The United Nations Declaration of Principles on Tolerance, 95, asserts, tolerance involves the rejection of dogmatism and absolutism. But why? Might one not hold a certain dogma to be correct, to hold it absolutely while insisting that others have the right to hold conflicting things to be dogmatically true? Indeed, does not the assertion tolerance involves the rejection of dogmatism and absolutism? Doesn't it sound, well, a trifle dogmatic and absolute? Thomas Hembock, Executive Vice President of the National Lambda Chi Alpha Fraternity writes, the definition of the new tolerance is that every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyle, and perception of truth claims are equal. There is no hierarchy of truth. Your beliefs and my beliefs are equal and all truth is relative. But if, however, the new tolerance evaluates all values and beliefs as positions worthy of respect, one may reasonably ask if this includes Nazism. Stalinism, child sacrifice, or how about the stances of the Ku Klux Klan or other assorted ethnic supremacist groups? What starts off sounding broad-minded and wise is self-destructive and stupid. In other words, I claim that the new tolerance is intellectually confused and morally bankrupt. It's intellectually confused because it is so redefined tolerance as to be nonsensical. I can understand what this statement means. Capitalist so-and-so tolerates communist so-and-so. I understand what that means. I can understand what that means provided I'm using the old definition of tolerance. But under the new definition of tolerance, capitalist A can't actually disagree with capitalist B, with communist B. The capitalist might say, I dislike your views, but dare not say your views are profoundly wrong, they're evil. They're mistaken, or vice versa. The communists can't say to the capitalist, they're wrong, they're, they're evil, they're mistaken. The most he can say is, I don't like them, they're not my choice. But your views are fine for you, and my views are fine for me. In which case, what does tolerance actually mean? I don't think you can speak intelligibly of tolerance until you disagree with people in the first place. 
you have to be able to say, I think your ideas in some domain or other are, are nonsensical. But well, okay, you can, you can hold them for you if you like. There are no sanctions against you, but, but it's really ridiculous. But if you say, I can't disagree with you, and I tolerate you. <laughs> Words are losing all their meaning. Do you, do, 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 do you see? It, it, is, it is an intellectually bankrupt perspective. But it's equally a morally bankrupt perspective because it thinks of itself as holding the virtuous high ground since tolerance has become the supreme virtue. It holds the high ground, it thinks, while being massively intolerant of absolutely anybody and any position that disagrees with its own definition of tolerance in the first place. And thus it is an intrinsically intolerant position. That's why it's morally bankrupt. It claims to be following one thing and in fact is bankrupt across the board. Now this could be pursued on all kinds of fronts. But let, let me take up one area that is incredibly sensitive today. I understand this. Today there is probably no more hot button conversation topic in public concourse than homosexuality. Recently a young woman of my acquaintance, a, a junior clerk in a, in a company, she was just doing her work and a chap she had seen in the office that she hadn't known really came up to her and said, I hear that you're a Christian. She said, yes, I am. Does that mean you hate me because I'm a homosexual? She said, no, I, I, I don't hate you. I don't even know you. I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. I, I, I believe what the Bible says, that, that homosexuality is not a good thing. But, but, but I, the Bible says there are lots of things that are not good things. I'm happy to know you. I'm happy to work with you. He went to HR and complained that he felt threatened and diminished by this homophobic Christian in the office. She was fired on Monday in the name of tolerance. Now God help us. There are a lot of intolerant people out there with respect to homosexuals people who make filthy jokes and diminishing comments. But as I read the current scene, there's a lot more intolerance coming from the homosexual side toward those who actually disagree with them on their moral position. Anyone who disagrees with them is automatically homophobic. And therefore, it is impossible to have a serious moral discussion about homosexuality or any other form of sexual behavior and conduct because already you have been marginalized by the label homophobic, by the label intolerant. That's a defeater belief and thus it refuses to engage. This is part of a much bigger phenomenon in culture. In the past, whether you came from a Catholic tradition of natural law or from the confessional Protestant position that insisted that there is something of God's moral law that is written on the human conscience, on the human heart. Nevertheless, it was widely presupposed in Western culture, granted this Judeo-Christian heritage, that there are many moral issues that are pre-political. That is, before you start talking politics, you have to start talking right and wrong. But if you hold that nothing is pre-political, then you establish right and wrong by judicial decisions. You establish right and wrong by legislation. You establish right and wrong by political fiat. And nothing is pre-political. That means that what you work hard for is political decisions that go in the direction that you want things to go. If the court says that it's okay, then it's okay. It's a good thing. And if you think it's a bad thing, then quite frankly, you're intolerant. And so it has become extraordinarily difficult to undertake serious moral discourse in our conversation, on any num in our generation, on any number of subjects today, partly because 
Most people in our culture do not have categories for pre-political discussion of moral issues. Now that's even before I start quoting chapter and verse. So we are entering a time, therefore, in Western culture where unless this turns around in Reformation and Revival or the swing of a pendulum or whatever, there is very little doubt in my mind that if current trends continue, you will sooner or later, sooner rather than later, find Christian congregations or Christian institutions or, 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 or Christians in general losing their jobs like this young woman who lost her job a couple of weeks ago or being fined prodigious amounts and so on simply because they are already judged to have committed the most heinous offense, namely, they are intolerant. And the question begins to arise, how do we address such matters? Well, that would be a lecture in itself. But let me say a few things. The book that I mentioned, The Intolerance of Tolerance, tries to tease this out in much more detail and traces also something of the history of tolerance in Christian circles and outside to understand what the various contributions of ethical thinkers have been and then to look at what Scripture says about some of these issues. It really is important to put this discussion in a broader historical framework. We, we didn't suddenly spring up. There, there, there are trends and, and traces in culture that have, have shaped us and brought us to this point. And a thinking Christian ought to try to find out what they are. But supposing things go really badly, they may not, they may not. God may raise things up in, in spectacular reformation and revival. God may give a swing of the pendulum another direction. I, I, I am neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. And as a friend of mine says, I work for a nonprofit organization. <laughs> But nevertheless, there are some things that can be said if, 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 a, wheel, if a wheel is coming off. Our, our dear friend and uh, brother Al Mohler is writing a book. I think the title is something like The Day After or something like that. What it means is, is eventually the courts come down and say uh, homosexual marriage, for example, is, is the law of the land. It's protected by the Constitution, so read. Uh, what happens next? I'm looking forward to reading the book. Then I can find out what I'm supposed to have said in this talk. <laughs> but there are a number of things that must be said. Number one is, still, love people. Do not go on a hate binge. Do, 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 do not paint those who disagree with you as, as, as demons. Uh, uh, talk. Love people. And, 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 and likewise, it, you try to evangelize anybody, homosexual, heterosexual, I don't really care. You still evangelize people with care and interest and have them in your homes and for meals and cherish them. Um, love, love is a powerful witness even in and of itself, do, do, do you see? Now, when it comes to Christian acceptance of converted homosexuals in the church, that's another whole subject I would love to get into. That one's just too big here. Then second, I would say, be prepared to suffer. It may come to that. In which case, don't lash out. Just be faithful to Jesus. It may come to that. It may not, but it may. And thirdly, in some cases, it's worth challenging some of this. Now, you have to do it with the right attitude. You recall how sometimes in his ministry, Paul simply accepts a Roman beating. And other times he says, oops, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. You don't have the right to do that. Now, I think that there are reasons, discernible reasons, that I don't have time to go into here about why Paul sometimes adopts one stance and sometimes another stance. But there are times to challenge the decisions that are coming down. For example, if this young woman who got sacked a couple of weeks ago of my acquaintance, if she had been another sort of personality, if she had had more money, if she had had more courage, she might have questioned that decision on the ground of its intolerance because she wasn't threatening anybody or demeaning anybody. She had not said a harsh word. 
So it becomes important sometimes for Christians to stand up to see if the courts, in fact, will start striking a mediating stance if, if certain positions are held up straight. Do, do, do you see? Not just for her own sake because she wants to keep a job, but because it sets up a certain standard that protects the next person who is in a similar situation. Do, 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 do you see? It becomes an act of Christian charity to protect and safeguard the stance of other Christians who find themselves in the same sort of, the same sort of position. M my prediction is there will be lots and lots and lots of such cases in the future before this sort of settles down, even on the worst projection, because, because some of this is so transparently intolerant and foolish that it is going to get challenged in the courts. And when all else fails, finally, be happy. That is, don't go around frightened. Be a joyful, confident Christian in happy allegiance to Jesus who says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if that means some of us have to take some knocks, so be it. God's no one's debtor. It'll all get sorted out in eternity. Meanwhile, we will bear witness to Christ Jesus and try to practice the best kind of tolerance, knowing that in the end, there is one judge, and he will make the book straight. Now, I have a little flashing clock down in front of me here, which tells me we've got about five minutes. In fact, we might have a little more than that. Uh, about five minutes for Q&A. So if anyone would like to ask a question, there are two microphones here. I don't think there are any microphones in those aisles. Can't see them with the lights on. But there are two microphones here. If you want to come up to one of those microphones and ask a question so that everybody can hear it for posterity, um, that would be really wonderful. Hey, Dr. Carson. How do you recommend pastors speak to their congregations regarding this homosexual issue? An astute question, one that many, many are asking. If you are dealing with Scripture in an expository fashion, you will come up with these sorts of passages, and you, the best way to deal with them is, is as you come up with them. If you're going through 1 Corinthians, you're going to deal with them. If you're coming through Romans, you're going to deal with them, and so forth. But then there is also a place when you're dealing, let's say, with passages in Leviticus to talk more broadly about the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New, because the biggest charge that is brought up is uh, biggest. I don't know if it's the biggest. One of the biggest charges that's brought up is you Christians cite one passage in Leviticus, but don't talk about stoning adulterers. That is tied up with the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New and, 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 and questions of that sort. So it's important for Christians to have a whole Bible understanding how their whole Bible is put together, a whole theology that is mature to, to think through what the texts say. By and large, I would not fly a banner out the front that says, Sunday night, Pastor Bob is speaking on homosexuality. Um, a brother on the Council of the Coalition, someone whose name most of you know, recently was preaching through biblical texts. And in the context of biblical texts, the text that he was expounding mentioned quite a number of sins. He had about 90 seconds in the sermon on homosexuality, but he mentioned all kinds of other things, infidelity and hate and whatever other sins he mentioned. But in fact, there was someone who sat in on the congregation that Sunday, a lesbian, as it turned out. It was her first visit. She fastened in on that, ra raised the banner, and the next week outside the church, there were, there were parades and banners, and, and he was dismissed as a homophobic person and articles in the newspaper and all of that. So to be quite frank, when I am speaking on the subject, um, I insist on letting people know privately and in smaller numbers. And then I'm prepared to talk about it at length. Not because I'm afraid of conflict, but because the conflict usually comes in so heavily that uh, it's impossible to, to have a rational discussion. Now, I have had some private, serious, rational discussions on university campuses with those who disagree on this point or another. But by and large, in the local church, what I would recommend is um, don't fly the, don't make this a federal issue. 
but just be faithful right across the board. Preach the gospel. Preach the word with integrity. And if it, there comes a time when you have to speak a, a, a little more comprehensively in a topical fashion, then do it without announcing it. Just go ahead and quietly do it. Sir. Yes. Um, could you explain in a little more depth why uh, a group like the New Atheism, which is fundamentally intolerant by any meaningful sense of that word, can claim the language of tolerance and be intellectually acceptable at that, on that level? Well, that's a good question, and, but it's bound up with the fact that uh, there's an awful lot of the new tolerance, the, the new intolerance, that is remarkably inconsistent. It's, it's, uh, it's not an even-handed or a rationally sensible position. Uh, so um, I, I would argue that the new atheism is virulent, it's interesting, it's, uh, it's, it's sharp, it's not particularly profound, it understands almost nothing about epistemology. Um, but, but it, it makes a good counter uh, a, a partner in debate and discussion. Um, but those who are already committed to a secular worldview will already have biases on, 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 on that side. So inevitably there are biases in all of our positions and, 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 and once tolerance itself becomes the, the, the chief virtue, then those who agree with you, you bless as tolerant whether or not they are, and those who disagree with you, you curse as intolerant whether or not they are. That's the new rhetoric because the tolerance, intolerance axis is what's dividing good and evil. Sir. Yes. Um, I, and I'm sure many here, have relatives and, and friends who are practicing homosexuals or um, adamantly pluralistic in their belief systems. And um, I guess what I'm saying is that this, the intellectual conversation that we're having um, seems to be relegated to an insider conversation now um, and ineffective in, in like open debates. Like you don't want to have open debates with your homosexual friends. So um, while these intellectual ideas are very helpful, how, how do we use them in loving those people? Um, and how, how does he let those flesh out in practical ways to love homosexuals and pluralists? That's an, an astute question as well. Um, in some ways, this is an in-house debate, but not entirely. I was on the Berkeley campus a few months ago where the topic given me uh, in front of 600-odd students or so was the intolerance of tolerance. And I talked along much these same lines. I didn't mention much about homosexuality, but in the hour-long Q&A afterwards, it came up. And in that, uh, in, that, in that context, it was wonderful. Things went courteously, and, and uh, it, 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 there's a possibility of, of having serious engagement along these lines. But if you're talking about the level of personally sharing the gospel and that sort of thing, yes, here we're talking about the nature of a social phenomenon, not how, how to share the gospel. And um, here I would say quite a lot of other things. I don't want to turn this talk into a talk on... On, on homosexuality and homosexual evangelism and so on, because I'm, I'm really talking about the nature of tolerance. Homosexuality was merely um, a, a particularly focused uh, case of it. But, but I, I would say this. In my experience, at least, when I have seen homosexuals converted, and I've seen quite a number of them converted over the years, um, they, they, they tend to go into one of, of three patterns if they're genuinely converted. Th there are... Let me backtrack. In one government report that I read a few years ago, it was a government report, I don't know how accurate it was, it said at the time that it's, the government's estimate was that 87% of male homosexuals were in fact bisexual. If you are in some sense bisexual, then obviously you can have sex either way. That means that in some degree or another, there's an element of choice. At least for those 87%. And what are you doing then in terms of feeding your imagination? Where's your fantasy life going? But there's another 13%, according to that particular report, that can only go one way. 
Now, supposing they get converted, what happens? I don't know comparable statistics for lesbians, but in my experience, um, there is more lesbian experimentation. Then what I have discovered is that some, when they get converted with <coughs> care and Bible teaching and rigorous friendship, in fact, really may revert and become heterosexuals. They may. But that percentage, in my experience, has been small. Some remain homosexual in orientation all the days of their life. But they find their self-identity not in their sexuality, but in Christ Jesus, and are happy to remain celibate for Jesus' sake. The closest analogy I can think of is I've been married to my wife now for 37, almost 38 years. But supposing six months after we had got married, she had been paralyzed in some terrible motor accident, but remained in a semi-vegetative state for the next 35 years. Would I have the right to remarry? To sleep around? No, no, for Jesus' sake, because my identity is not finally in the marriage, nor even in my favorite wife, nor in sex, nor in heterosexuality, but in Jesus, therefore I will be content and rejoice in the celibacy of those years. I think there are some homosexuals who are converted who take that stance. I could introduce you to some. And there are still others who, with the care of a thoughtful church and wise pastors, let's take a male homosexual, and a really wonderful, godly woman actually enter into a heterosexual marriage, have children, have tight intimacy, but will still tell you if they stray from Jesus, where their imagination and their fantasy is going is still on the homosexual side. And they live with that with what degree of faithfulness they can muster by the grace of God under the gospel until resurrection bodies in the new heaven and the new earth. These are extraordinarily complex issues. I have no doubt that God can, poof, change things. But in my experience of people who are converted, that's the gamut of things that I see. And I think that more information along these lines from experienced counselors who are far wiser and more experienced than the David Paulisons of this world, um, whose, whose witness on this front is very similar to my own, um, and who has a lot more experience than I'll ever have. Um, it, 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 it seems to me that we, we need to think in, in careful, understated ways about, about what happens when men and women come to Christ carrying all kinds of baggage, including that particular baggage. Yes. So I serve in a campus ministry on college campuses, and one of the challenges that our groups face is that, that largely we are the, the, the subject of being called you know, intolerant. And what's happening now is just we're either not being allowed access to campuses or we're being kind of kicked off campuses. And the question comes up, um, when is it worth challenging? Now, now largely yeah. it's been in the past because of conversion, evangelism, we're trying to see conversions and evangelize. Yeah. Most recently in the last year, it's been more our views on homosexuality. Yeah. Yes. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about what you said about Paul accepting beating sometimes, other times appealing to his citizenship? Yes, his situation is a bit different. It seems to me, as I read the texts closely, that Paul will accept the uh, beating for Christ's sake, if it's simply a question of identifying himself as a Christian and so on, and there are no entailments for others. But where, in fact, it might protect others for him to question it on various legal grounds, he's prepared to do so. Now, I don't have a formulaic answer to your question, but there have been quite a number of courts 
that have defended, that have actually supported the Christian plaintiff when the plaintiff says that he or she has been kicked off the campus uh, illegitimately. And, and the argument is pretty obvious. And usually the, the question arises because the student government has some sort of uh, policy of, of uh, non-discrimination that is extraordinarily broad. And therefore, if you say that as a Christian group, um, uh, the, the leaders of that particular Christian group must be in line with uh, what the Bible says about uh, sexuality or whatever it says, um, then, then, then you're, you're uh, running in defiance of the university's um, uh, uh, regulations. But if you say, does that mean that the local Hillel group uh, could allow in a Nazi as a as, as uh, on their, their board? Does a, a local Muslim uh, allow in an evangelical Christian? I mean, it becomes so silly so fast. So that what you're having in the name of diversity is not diversity. In real diversity, you have different pockets on the campus who are all doing their own thing, but then you need the old kind of tolerance. But in the name of diversity, um, what is being asked for is lowest common den denominator commonality so as to elevate that virtue of the new tolerance to the supreme level. And when that's been challenged in court, it is usually won. And if you get enough of those winnings, then it's a lot harder for the next university to, 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 to kick out a, a campus group. But that takes courage, takes money, takes time. I understand that. But the jury's not, the jury's not out on this one yet. It's, it's complicated. And it's not here, just in the, I mean, similar, UCCF in Britain, University and Colleges Christian Fellowship in Britain, has had similar court cases and so on. So far, they've won. And, um, and that might change just with a degenerating culture. But, but I would still say some of these things are worth, are worth tackling, partly because we are a democracy, and therefore we do have some responsibility for government. We have some options open to us that the Apostle Paul didn't have. He could, re he could not really conceive of taking, taking Caesar to court. Sir. So Obamacare is now going to collect taxes for abortion and contraceptives. Do we tolerate the tax and just pay? That's a really difficult one. It's, if you're talking about taxes in general, uh, you, you can't have a transaction at a bank. You, 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 can't, uh, you can't buy a stock. You, you can't invest anywhere nowadays without having some money going somewhere that you don't want it to go. I mean, it's the complexity and integration of our whole system. But that's a bit different from um, a Christian organization that has taken a public stance on religious grounds against um, uh, abortion or against um, uh, abortifacients. I mean, it, it might not be against all pills, for example, but uh, uh, those, those that uh, get rid of the baby by a, a kind of uh, a, a abortion. The best book on the, the subject, on the moral and theological integration of the subject that I know, is a recent one by Megan Best. It's probably in the bookstore as well. I don't know if she's here for this pre-council, but she's certainly here for the conference, but she's certainly here for the main conference and is, is running one of the workshops. She's a medical doctor from Australia. And, uh, and her book, it, I forgot what it, uh, I forgot what the book is called, but I'm sure that it's out there in the, uh, in, in the, in the exhibition place. And, and there the issues, I would want to argue, are important enough to fight over. So um, uh, Wheaton College and the Catholic University of America have separate lawsuits in, uh, and the jury's out on what some of these things are going to mean. Uh, w the real thing that the Obamacare bill is pulling off here is trying to um, define what is and is not a religious exception. So that, in theory, they're not overturning the Second Amendment. They're merely defining its applicability to a narrower and narrower focus. And that gives the government the right, then, to define what is and is not religion. So, in other words, if you're running a seminary, um, it might be that the people teaching Bible might be protected and you wouldn't be able to force them to have the kind of um, insurance policy that uh, provided uh, contraception or whatever. Um, but if you're the gardener on the property, then uh, because he's not teaching the Bible, then, then he would not be protected and so forth. That sort of debate is coming down the track big time. And it may well be that there will be some huge cases huge court costs, huge loss, huge penalties, huge fines before that one is sorted out. And I, I, I think Christians are going to have to stand up for that one. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 
Previously, I had an employer with a lot of uh, HR training and development that worked around the area of tolerance. Uh, I've moved on and I work with a different employer now. And uh, just in general terms with tolerance, uh, haven't had any issues and very grateful for the position. I mean, I'm in the financial services industry. If there was a situation, and maybe there's other people here wondering uh, where tolerance was brought to the table from HR, from someone who felt diminished or threatened, uh, what would you recommend as of a course of action for that? For someone who felt diminished and threatened? Uh, someone who accused you of feeling diminished or threatened, uh, HR contacted you, and now you're in a position where maybe you would lose your job over that. Yeah. Um, what, what would you recommend, and, and like you said, not in every situation, right. but in some situations that might be... First step, I would like to explain to HR what I think, uh, what my attitude is, what the conversation was, and then I would even suggest, if the person is willing, for HR to mediate a face-to-face -face talk or with any media, mediator that they wanted with this person so that, so, so that there's a, a, an open as, a discussion as possible instead of this thing going immediately to courts. Uh, I, the automatic ruling out of a position under the flag of intolerance is precisely what's knocking out conversation. And so I, 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 I confess I'd want to push very hard on those sorts of fronts first. But it may be that in some cases there, would, there will eventually be, whether I like them or not, there will eventually be court cases about whether or not the, uh, the HR folk have acted um, in a discriminatory fashion by getting rid of this person uh, who, who happens to be a Christian, provided he or she has not done anything genuinely defamatory. Last question coming up. Hi. Uh, in order to embrace uh, Christian tolerance, this old version of tolerance, uh, would you see us uh, embracing a libertarian perspective or participation, uh, a libertarian government? Or would you, you spoke to degrees of tolerance and, you know, how would you address someone who would say pornography, yeah. uh, uh, opposing pornography would be legislating morality. Yes. So is, is being tolerant in the, the old definition being libertarian or yes. is there some legitimacy to, you know, banning pornography, uh, things like that? Another huge question. It's got many, many implications. It deserves another hour just in itself. But let me try to answer briefly. The, the, the question is this. The, the, there are many, many younger people today especially who are saying, as a Christian, I agree with you that homosexuality is condemned by the Bible. I don't want to practice it. I don't want to see it in the church. But I don't think it's right to legislate against it. Um, if it if, if it is approved, that, that's fine. Uh, who, who am I to legislate against something that others do uh, in, in any domain of morality whatsoever? And that's a more libertarian view of moral, moral issues. And, um, and, and thus it becomes possible, allegedly, to go along with the courts without challenging anything and, and, uh, and ha have a certain kind of peace and keep your head down and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and, and all of us, all of us are drawn toward that on certain fronts. I mean, I, I suspect there are not many people in the room today that want to criminalize homosexuality and throw people in prison for being homosexuals, although that was the standard a century ago in much of the Western world. So why should we want to do it for homosexual marriage? It, it's, it is a complicated issue. At the same time, the libertarian view has no real place for seeing that Christians have a responsibility for what they judge to be good for the culture. In other words, they're building, it's traditional, in traditional terms, it's the Anabaptist view. They're building their own little structure and society over here, and they have no responsibility for the broader world. But if Christians hold that they do have a responsibility for the broader world, even if they lose in public debate, if they say that this is ultimately going to be very harmful to society, if we lose the value of what marriage is in biblical categories, then society itself is losing something. Whether or not society becomes a Christian society or not, or more people get converted or not, is, is in one sense irrelevant to the question of whether or not we have social responsibilities to do good to all men, especially those of the household of God, and have a responsibility to, to bear witness as best we can with integrity, humility, winsomeness, godliness, to get moral conversation back into the public discourse. 
If you hold that to be the case, as I do, then the strict extreme libertarian view, the, the Anabaptist position on moral issues, in my view, is not defensible. But I understand the issues and they are complex. God bless you.